let's look at the quote from from Mark Zuckerberg. So uh, at uh, at 64 uh, minutes and 31 seconds on the video, I <laughs> yes. time coded this. Guy. This is the this is excellent. This is the very helpful YouTube transcript. Yeah. YouTube's an amazing uh, program. Um, you ask him about Francis Haugen. You give him a chance to respond. Uh, and here's the key thing. Um, uh, so he talks about what Francis Haugen said. He said, no, but that's mischaracterized. Actually, on most measures, the kids are doing better when they're on Instagram. It's just on one out of the 18. Yeah. Uh, and then he says, um, I think an accurate characterization would have been that kids using Instagram, uh, or not kids, but teens, is generally positive for their mental health. That's his claim, that, you t that uh, uh, Instagram is overall, taken as a whole, Instagram is positive for their mental health. That's what he says. Okay, um, now, is it really, is it really? Uh, so first, just the simple, okay, now here, what I'd like to do is turn my attention to another document that we'll make available. Yeah. Um, so I was invited to give uh, testimony before a Senate subcommittee two weeks ago, uh, where they were considering the Platform Accountability Act, should we force the platforms to actually tell us what our kids are doing? Like, we have no idea other than self-report, we have no idea. You know, they're the only ones who know, like the kid does this, and then over the next hours, the kid's depressed or happy. We can't know that, but mm -hmm. but Facebook knows it. Um, so should they be compelled to uh, to reveal the data? We need that. So you raised just uh, uh, to give people a little bit of context, and this document is brilliantly structured with questions, studies that indicate that the answer to a question is yes, indicate that the answer to a question is no, and then mixed results. And questions include things like, does social media make people more angry or effectively polarized? Right. Wait, does so that's, social... the, that's the one that we're going to get to. That's the one for democracy. Yes, that's for so democracy. Yeah, so I've, yeah, I've got three different Google Docs here because I found this is an amazing way, and thank God for Google Docs. Yeah. It's an amazing way to organize the research literature, and it's a collaborative review, meaning that, so on this one, Gene Twenge and I put up the first draft, and then we say, please, you know, comment. Add studies, tell us what we missed. And it evolves in real time. In any direction, the yes or the no. Oh yeah, we, we specifically encourage, because I look, my, the center of my research is that our gut feelings drive our reasoning. That's, that was my dissertation. That was my early research. And so if Gene Twenge and I are committed to, but we're going to obviously preferentially believe that these platforms are bad for kids because we said so in our books. Mm -hmm. So we have confirmation bias. And I'm a devotee of John Stuart Mill. The only cure for confirmation bias is other people who have a different confirmation bias. So these documents evolve because critics then say, no, you missed this. Or they say, you don't know what you're talking about. It's like, great. Say so. Tell us. Um, so I put together this document, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put links to everything on my website. If users, if users, sorry, if listeners, viewers, go to jonathanheightcom slash social media. Um, it's a new page I just created. I'll put everything together in one place there, and right. we'll put those in the show notes. Like links to this document and and, and other things like it that we're That's talking right. about. That's right. Exactly. Great. So yeah. So the thing I want to call attention to now is this document. This document here with the title, Teen Mental Health is Plummeting and Social Media is a Major Contributing Cause. Yeah. Um, so Ben Sass and Chris Coons are on the Judiciary Committee. They had a subcommittee hearing on uh, Nate Priscilli's bill, uh, Platform Accountability Transparency Act. So they asked me to testify on what do we know, what's going on with teen mental health. And so what I did was I put together everything I know with, with plenty of graphs um, to make these points that First, what do we know about the crisis? Well, uh, that the crisis is specific to mood, mood disorders, not everything else. It's uh, it's not just self-report, it's also behavioral data because suicide and self-harm go skyrocketing after 2010. Um, the increases are very large and the crisis is gendered um, and it's hit many countries. So I go through the data on that. So mm -hmm. we have a pretty clear characterization and nobody's disputed me on this, on this part. So can we just pause real quick, just so for people who are not uh, aware. So self-report, just how you kind of collect data on this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Sure. You, you have a self-report is survey. You ask people. Uh, how, yeah, how anxious are you these days? Yeah. How many hours a week do you use social media? That, that kind of stuff. And you, and you do, it's maybe, uh, you can collect large amounts of data that way because you can ask a large number of people that kind of question. And But then there's, um, I forget the term you use, but more, uh, so non self report data, yeah, behavioral data, behavioral data. Yeah, that's that's right. right. Where you actually have self harm and uh, suicide mm -hmm. numbers. Exactly. So there are a lot of graphs like this. So this is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. So that so the federal government and also Pew and Gallup. There are a lot of of organizations that have been collecting survey data for decades. So this is a gold mine. And what you see on these graphs over and over again is relatively straight lines up until around 2010 or 2012. And on the x-axis, we have time, years going from 
2004 to 2020 on the y-axis is the percent of U.S. teens who had a major depression in the last year. Mm -hmm. That's right. So when this data started coming out around, so Jean Twang's book, IGEN, 2017, a lot of people say, oh, she, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about. This is just self-report. Like Gen Z, they're just really comfortable talking about this. This is a good thing. This isn't a real epidemic. And literally the day before my book with Greg was published, the day before, uh, there was a psychiatrist in, in New York Times who had an op-ed saying, relax. Cell phones, uh, smartphones are not ruining your kid's brain. And he said, it's just self-report. It's just that they're, they're, they're giving higher rates, there's more diagnosis, but underlying there's no change. No, because these, gra these it's th theoretically possible, but all we have to do is look at the hospitalization data for self-harm and suicide, and we see the exact same trends. We see also a very sudden, big rise um, around uh, between 2009 and 2012, you have an elbow, and then it goes up, up, up. So and that is not self-report. Those are actual kids admitted to hospitals for cutting themselves. Um, so we have a catastrophe, and this was all true before COVID. COVID made things worse, but we have to realize, um, you know, COVID's going away, kids are back in school, or back in school but we're not going to go back to where we were because this problem is not caused by COVID. What is it caused by? Um, well, uh, just again, to just go through the point, then I'll stop. I, I just feel like I'm, I just really don't want to get out the data mm -hmm. to show that no, Mark is, is wrong. So first point, correlational studies consistently show a link. They almost all do, but it's not big. It, it, equivalent to a correlation coefficient around 0.1, typically. Um, that's the first point. The second point, um, is that um, this the correlation is actually much larger than for eating potatoes. So that famous line wasn't about social media use. That was about digital media use. That included watching Netflix, doing homework on everything. Yeah. And so what they did is they, they looked at all screen use, and then they said, this is correlated with self-reports of depression, anxiety, at like, you know, 0.03, it's tiny. Um, and but well, they said that clearly in the paper, but the media has reported as social media mm. is 0.03 or tiny. And that's just not true. What I found digging into it, you don't know this until you look at the, the there's more than 100 studies in the, in the Google Doc. Once you dig in, what you see is, okay, you see a tiny correlation. What happens if we zoom in on just social media? It always gets bigger, often a lot bigger, two or three times bigger. Um, what happens if we zoom in on girls and social media? It always gets bigger, often a lot bigger. And so, um, what I think we can conclude, in fact, what one of the authors of the potato studies herself concludes, um, Amy Orban says, I, I think I have a quote from here, she reviewed a lot of studies and she herself said that, quote, the associations between social media use and well-being therefore range from about R equals 0.15 to R equals 0.10. Um, so that's the range we're talking about. And that's for boys and girls together. Um, and a lot of research, including hers and mine, show that girls, it's higher. So for girls, we're talking about correlations around 0.15 to 0.2, I believe. Jean Twenge and I found it's about 0.2 or 0.22. Now, this might sound like an arcane social science debate, but people have to understand, public health correlations are almost never above 0.2. So the correlation of childhood exposure to lead and adult IQ, very serious problem, that's 0.09. Like the world's messy and our measurements are messy. And so if you find a consistent correlation of 0.15, like you would never let your kid do that thing. That actually is dangerous. And it can explain when you multiply it over tens of millions of kids spending, you know, years of their lives, you actually can explain the mental health epidemic just from social media use. Mm -hmm. Well, and then there's questions. By the way, uh, this is really good to learn because I quit potatoes and it had no effect on me. Uh, <laughs> and as a Russian, fine. that was a big sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, quite literal, actually, because I'm mostly eating keto these days. But that's 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 funny that they're actually literally called the potato studies. Okay, uh, but given this, and there's a lot of fascinating data here. There's also a discussion of how to how to fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the aspects? that if fixed would uh, start to reverse some of these trends. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. if we just l l linger on the sort of the Mark Zuckerberg statements. So first of all, do you think Mark is aware of some of these studies? So if we, if you put yourself in the shoes of Mark Zuckerberg and the executives at Facebook mm -hmm. and Twitter, how can you try to understand the studies like the Google Docs you put together? Mm -hmm to try to make decisions that fix things? Is, 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 is there a stable science now that you can start to investigate? And, and also maybe uh, if you can comment on the depth of data that's available, because ultimately, 
And this is something you argue that the data should be more uh, transparent, should be provided. But currently, if it's not, all you have is maybe some leaks of internal data. That's right. That's right. Um, and we could talk about the potential. You have to be very sort of objective about the potential bias in those kinds of leaks. You want to, mm -hmm. it would be nice to have a uh, non-leak data. Like, like. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to actually have academic researchers able to access in de-individuated, de-identified form, um, the actual data on what kids are doing and how their mood changes. And, and you know, when people commit suicide, what was happening before. And it'd be great to know that. We have no idea.